Hello and welcome to Just a Bite podcast, where we discuss dining, blogging, and social media. Your host is Malika Bowling, author, blogger, and president of the Association of Food Bloggers. Hi, this is Malika Bowling with the Association of Food Bloggers, and this is the Just a Bite podcast. And today we're lucky to be talking to Jennifer Harris who is the expert when it comes to gluten-free eating in Atlanta. She writes the Gluten-Free Go-To Guide, and she also writes for The Examiner. And in addition to that, she's also a consultant to many restaurants in uh, producing gluten-free foods. So thank you, Jennifer, for taking the time to be with us today, and welcome. Thank you for having me. So I wanted to... uh, just jump right into it and talk about, um, tell us a little bit about um, celiac disease and what it involves, because I think a lot of people just aren't that familiar with it. Okay. Um, celiac disease is an autoimmune disorder, um, which means it, it affects uh, your ability to digest foods. And one of those foods that people with celiac disease can't digest is gluten. Gluten is a protein uh, that's found in uh, wheat, rye, and barley, and it's what gives uh, that elastic texture, um, that flakiness to pie crust, that moistness to breads. Um, so it's in a lot of things. <laughs> it's not just in breads. It's in pastas. It's in sauces. Um, it's in gravies. It's in salad dressing. So finding out that you have celiac disease means you have to go on a gluten-free diet. There is no medical pill. There is no cure for it other than following a gluten-free diet. Um, And calling it a gluten-free diet is a little misleading. It's a gluten-free lifestyle. So for the rest of my life, I will only eat products that are gluten-free. Okay. Now, is that something that you would pass on to your children? It is genetic. Um, There is Mm -hmm. a possibility that you can pass it on um, uh, or you, you, you might not. So it's, it's not set in stone that if one parent has it, the child will get it. Um, I've had my daughter tested for it a couple times now, and uh, she keeps coming back negative. But celiac disease is kind of sneaky. Um, you can be born with, with the gene, but you can't develop it until you start eating gluten. So you can't be born with celiac disease, but you can be born with one of the two genes. Um, and doctors still don't understand what triggers the gene. Um, I had symptoms of celiac disease starting when I was seven, um, but I didn't get diagnosed until I was 27. And during that period of time, my symptoms would come and go, and they would get worse, and then they would abate, and then a new system would, uh, I'm sorry, a new issue would pop up that uh, didn't make any sense to me. And it's tricky where it's, it's, it's hard to diagnose, it's hard to pinpoint what causes that gene to go active. Um, but once it goes active, you you if you try to ingest gluten it would be a huge mistake <laughs> and so do you think that cuz i you know i know that that's something when i was growing up as a child mm-hmm. you never really heard about this so is this something do you think as a result of the way that food is being processed in our country now well i think it is um the wheat of today isn't the wheat of of the 1950s um and it is overprocessed, which can make it harder to digest. Uh, but in general, I think that the I grew up in the 70s, and the quality of the food from the 70s to today, it's drastically different. And I think there's too much processed foods in most people's diets. Um, and and there's you know additives that are made from chemical combinations, and they aren't natural, which also makes products harder to digest. And um, artificial colors and artificial flavors, so it it can present itself in different ways. Um, when I found out I had celiac disease and I removed gluten from my diet, I also realized that I had a sensitivity to MSG and to hydrogenated oils, and that's only because um, I noticed the symptoms. I noticed that every time I ate Chinese food, even if it was gluten free, I still got the pounding headaches. And I didn't, I, I, you know, I, I can't say everything has gluten in it because it doesn't. So I had mm-hmm. to do a little bit of detective work to figure out what it was. 
Uh, my daughter's really sensitive to artificial colors and flavors. Uh, we discovered that when she was four. So sometimes it's just being more in tune uh, with your body, which I think most celiacs are, because we, you know, we notice when we try a new product how uh, we feel after we eat it and if we're experiencing any odd symptoms, and we're, gonna, we're going to investigate that. Yeah, I, I, I always tell people, you know, when they're interested in, in you know, quote, going gluten-free, um, you know, there's no need to eat gluten-free. You just should just eat products closer to their uh, original form, um, not and cut back on processed food, and you know, do some more cooking of your own. Go to restaurants that you know use quality ingredients, um, and and you're going to feel better. <laughs> you, mm-hmm. you just are. <laughs> yeah, that's that's very good advice. I think we could all do a little bit more of elimination of processed foods in our diet for sure. So can you talk to us, Jennifer, a little bit about the process of how you evolved from where you were when you started out in the corporate world to how you got into writing more about gluten-free living and the gluten-free lifestyle and and the consulting? Because obviously this podcast is for a lot of food bloggers, and I'm sure that they would be interested in getting into a specific niche just like you've done. So can you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, Most of my corporate career I spent in marketing, um, which involved um, data analysis and writing. So I went to school, and I have have a degree in public relations. So I had a writing background, and I had a a marketing research background. Um, Mm -hmm. I became very disillusioned with the corporate world, as I'm sure a lot of people are. Uh, working Working in a marketing department, you're pretty much the first people to get laid off if there's layoffs coming. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just got tired of it. Uh, I was recently married and was pregnant with my daughter and took the time off um, to take a step back. Uh, During that time, I was doing uh, volunteer work for the Gluten Intolerance Group of Atlanta, which is um, a support group, local support group for people who eat gluten-free. So I was doing product research and I was doing research on speakers and, you know, just trying to stay active even though I was a stay-at-home mom. Um, mm-hmm. While I was doing that, I got an, uh, an email for the membership uh, looking for a, a position at Return to Eden uh, for a gluten-free product specialist, and I decided to apply, um, got the job, and became immersed in the natural foods industry. And um, that job uh, led me to um, <clears throat> develop a lot of great vendor relationships and to really get in touch with what was going on locally in the Atlanta food scene. Um, That led me to writing for examiner.com. That was kind of a fluke. Uh, I knew someone else who was writing for him, and she suggested that I take it on. Uh, And so I I did. I just wanted to be able to share information from what I had learned, um, either through direct contact with companies or with uh, restaurants or just something that that I had seen on social media. So I started writing for them um, for – for Examiner, um, that led me to doing some magazine writing for Simply Gluten Free magazine, which was lovely. I wrote some uh, company profiles for them um, and really enjoyed that. Uh, and then that led to doing some writing for Gluten Free Living. Um, mm-hmm. I never really thought of myself as a writer. Uh, you know, I, I always thought everybody could write, but they really can't. <laughs> Yeah, and, that's and, very and, true. <laughs> and then, you know, going to school and, and getting a PR degree meant I took uh, many journalism classes and editing was one of my favorite, and uh, I learned a lot about style. So when I transitioned to writing, you know, I could write a complete sentence, and I knew when to capitalize things, and I knew how to, you know, um, source information. And, and a lot of people um, don't or didn't take that time to, to learn about style. So... I think my writing's really, um, it's very informative. It's really, it's not technical, but it's not, it's not punchy. It's just very straightforward, and that appeals to um, some magazines, um, which, is, which is great for me. Um, fr- from that, I've done some writing for Eater, and I, I really enjoy kind of transitioning from writing such a, a formal style to writing for Eater. So, I mean... 
if you have a desire to do any kind of writing and you have a passion about food, uh, I think finding your, your niche is, is really important. And the gluten-free food options just continue to expand as chefs become more and more aware that, you know, the gluten-free diet is not a fad. It is not a trend. And for people like me, we will be eating gluten-free foods for the rest of our lives. So they really are sitting up and take, and paying attention. Um, mm-hmm. I, I was doing a lot of free consulting. I didn't realize I was doing free consulting. But I was answering a lot of questions for chefs and friends with businesses about what I thought they should be doing and what I saw as trends. And um, then I just realized, hey, <laughs> I am a consultant, so I should just start uh, my consulting business and, and build it and grow it. And it's such a rewarding thing to do because I know that – Many people I'll never even meet will get to go into a restaurant where I've worked and eat gluten-free food that's prepared safely and it's really good and it's not overpriced. You know, it's the kind of things that, you know, you might not want to make at home, but, you mm-hmm. know, the comfort foods right. that you can order when you're out. So Yeah, yeah, and that's um, and that's great. You, you're helping these people eat eat better and healthier. And, and that's really, really good that you've been able to parlay writing into consulting. And mm-hmm. I think that a lot of bloggers, they struggle with that because it's, I think people assume that because you're a blogger that you're just willing to give away all this information for free. Right. And so did you have to just kind of Put your foot down one day and just say to these these restaurants, say, hey, you know, these, these are my fees. This is what I charge, yep. and if you don't like it, oh well. Is that well, I mean, in a way, I, I read this great article that that now I can't find um, that was about consulting, and I, I think it was titled um, "No, You Can't Pick My Brain in Exchange for a Tuna Sandwich," uh-huh. and it was all about you know people are like, hey, can I pick your brain and I'll take you out to lunch? Well, that's great yeah. that they want to take you out to lunch, but you know, if you're a consultant. And your fee shouldn't be the cost of a tuna sandwich. Your fee should be, you know, based on um, the quality of of the information that you're giving them. So I did. Um, I had to tell people, I am a consultant. This is my hourly rate. If that doesn't work for you, okay. But, you know, I can't continue to do these things um, without being um, compensated for all the information that I've gathered over the 17 years that I have been a celiac. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, I I have a background in food service. I used to work in hospitals as a chef. So I understand uh, where gluten can hide. I understand what it's like to work um, in a kitchen. Of course, restaurant kitchens are like a tenth of the size of a kitchen in a hospital. But I understand the equipment. I understand the fast pace and what's going on. So, you know, I've, I don't think that it, it, would be right for someone to ask you to do that for free. And, you know, honestly, once I started doing it, you know, and I was talking to chefs, they'd be like, well, well, make sure you get us and come with an invoice so that we can get sure to write you a check before you leave. Like once, once you put that step forward, I am a consultant. I am not just a blogger or I'm not a writer. I am a, this is a profession. They recognize it. Um, but if you come in, you know, and just sit and talk with them and they buy your lunch, they don't treat you like a consultant. So you kind of have to, Set yourself out there. I have a website. This is what it's called. Here's my business card. And then they're like, Mm -hmm. oh, okay. She really knows what she's talking about, and we we need to pay her for her her experience. (laughs) Yeah, it's funny that you brought up the, uh, no, you can't pick my brain for the cost of a tuna sandwich, because I I recently, not recently, but several months ago, I wrote an article about that, too, because... I was asked to, as as I do consulting um, on, for online marketing and PR work, I uh, I was asked by a a restaurant owner here in Atlanta to to come to his um, his restaurant to talk about these services of mine, and you know he acknowledged that I did that, and then um, when I got there, he wanted to pick my brain and ask me all these questions like where should I open up a new location and this and that. And it was over an hour drive for me to get there. And then right. at the end of this conversation, I said, well, okay, so when can we get started? What what services of mine do you want? And he said, oh, no, that's okay. I can manage these things myself. And right. I was like, I just really? was stunned. I, was yeah. like, I couldn't believe it. And so, and it's like it didn't even occur to him that he had done something wrong because right. – and then I had to look at look into what I was doing, how I was marketing myself, and it's like, well – 
yeah, maybe he did think somehow it was okay to do that. So now I'm very upfront with when somebody approaches me, I'm like, nope, this is my cost. I'm, I'm a consultant. If you want me to drive out there, then I'm going to bill you for the time I'm out there, and that's what it costs. And if you don't like it, oh, well. So I'm, I'm really glad to hear that other people are doing that too. So that's, that's really yeah. good advice. Yeah, just, just, you know, oh, can you come in and da-da-da-da-da, and we'll talk over lunch, and you're like, well, okay, but this is what it costs for an hour of consulting. And then they go, then there's either this, oh, and they're like, well, maybe, hmm, or they say, okay, we'll see you then. You know, as, yeah. but as long as, you know, if they, if they get you in there in any other way, then they just think, and, and it's, it's funny because you'll be in the conversation and you'll go, wait, why am I telling him this? And you're, and you're thinking to yourself, why do I keep answering all of his questions? Because it's, it's yeah. hard, it's really hard to talk money with people. It, it really is. And so it's hard to say, well, wait, why don't we schedule a, a consulting session and we can go over all this stuff and then, you know, why don't you just tell me about your business? It's hard to derail it once it starts going um, because you want to, you know, not show how smart you are, but you want to contribute to the conversation. And it's hard to say, hey, hey, stop, stop. You know, like this, this yeah. is a consulting session. We can, well, and we the other thing, too, is it's hard to, I mean, you have to show that you know what you're talking about. So right. I think it's a skill to be able to talk about this, this is my expertise, and I can share up to this point with you. And then right. it's just hard to know when to stop and, and to hold back because I, I, for me, I know I start talking and I get so excited about it because I love yep. food. Yep. I mm-hmm. love the restaurant industry and I love eating out, so I just want to share all this knowledge and it's hard for me to hold back and stop. But that's something I've, I've had to learn along the way. Um, so switching gears a little bit, one thing you said is that Atlanta is just such a fantastic city for – dining out, but especially if you do have celiac disease and you can't eat gluten, there are so many restaurants that are catering to that. Now, right. do you find, though, when you're traveling that you have a hard time finding those kind of restaurants that will cater to you? And, I mean, how do you go about that? Like, if you're planning a vacation, what do you do? Uh, well, I if I'm going into a new area I've never been before. I want to eat the local cuisine. I don't want to go and eat at a chain restaurant, even if they right. have a gluten-free menu. Um, um, I love P.F. Chang's, but, you know, when I go to Las Vegas, I'm not eating at P.F. Chang's. Um, so when I get into a new area, um, the first thing I usually do is I do a, an online search, and I look for local food bloggers, local gluten-free mm-hmm. bloggers, and I look for a local support group. Because usually the support group will have – uh, a list that they've compiled of great local places to eat. And then the food blogger will usually have reviews of a number of places so you can poke around and do some investigating on your own. And then you can reach out to them and say, I'm going to be in town for four days. What shouldn't I miss? Um, and I usually do that on Twitter. What, what shouldn't I miss? I'm going to be in town. I've never been here before. And you'll get back a lot of great information that, you know, the restaurant owners sometimes don't know how to market themselves to the gluten-free community. So they don't hide their light under a bushel, but they just don't scream gluten-free because some of them are afraid there will be some negative ramifications. So you kind of have to look mm-hmm. for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then once you do that, it's usually pretty great. Um, but you've got to do that work beforehand. It's hard if, you're just, if you just got off the plane and you're like, hey, where should I eat dinner? It's going to be a lot harder to find some place. Uh, and you might end up going to a chain restaurant um, instead. So d- doing that little bit of research and, and reaching out to the, the community, and the gluten-free community is, is huge, and we are, we are great about sharing great information, and we are good about telling people where not to go um, mm-hmm. because there's been a, 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 an issue with uh, safe handling. So we want, to, we want to promote the places that are doing it right. Uh, you know I mean? I, I think I eat out more now than I ever did before I was diagnosed with celiac disease. And I, you know, just because I have celiac disease doesn't mean that I should stay at home and cook for myself. I should be mm-hmm. able to go out and get a great meal just like anyone else. So I'm really passionate about it. I'm, you know, really out there um, challenging chefs. Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Have you ever thought of this? Okay, so I, I know you mentioned, Jennifer, that you look to these bloggers for advice on where to go eat, but is there no, like, sort of um, national site or something where somebody could go to and find a list of, like, by city? There where? are, no, there there are apps. There are a number of, of apps mm-hmm. out there. Um, the the one that most people use is called Find Me Gluten-Free. Okay. Um, and, it, and it can 
uh, pick up your GPS location and then tell you what's around you. Um, but mostly what I find on that app is a lot of chain restaurants. Um, there are some local places on there, but that app relies on users uploading reviews and uploading restaurants. So I use that one in a pinch. Like literally if I'm driving and I'm on the interstate and I'm starving and I'm looking <laughs> for a restaurant, I'm going to pull that up uh, and look. But if I've got enough time to do the research, I'll look at it. And if I find some place that's local, then I'll ask the food blogger about it because I want – because I want to get an honest opinion from somebody who's been there, and I don't know who's uploading information to the app. So I want, you know, I want to get that personal experience. Um, somebody who obviously suffers from that as well versus somebody else who maybe looked at their menu and they, it said they had gluten-free options. You know what I right. mean? So, yeah. yeah, I totally understand that. Now, when you're... It, like in your in your product search and in in your eating out and everything, have you found any specific type of food that it's just restaurants just can't seem to get it right? Um, pizza is a problem uh, because a lot of times restaurants just think if they bring in a gluten free crust that they can just make a pizza and serve it. Um, they really don't understand about cross contact and the need to use separate ingredients and separate utensils and you know, a separate pan and to cook the pizza on the top rack and not the bottom so nothing can fall on it, um, mm-hmm. And which it's, it's shocking to me because it's so easy to do it. It's so easy to make a gluten-free pizza that's safe. Um, and we've got a couple local places now that are making crusts from scratch in dedicated areas with separate ingredients. And, you know, forever it was always frozen crust, and now there's some places that are making um, fresh crust and, you know, for people who can eat wheat, that's not an issue because you're always, almost always eating a fresh crust. And for somebody like me to be able to find one, it's a huge deal. Um, so, yeah, pizza's a problem. Sometimes pasta's a problem because they don't, restaurants don't realize they have to cook it in uh, separate clean water and use a separate colander and separate utensils. So sometimes they cross-contaminate it because they just drop it into the pot filled with, you know, weedy pasta water. So they, mm-hmm. they just they, they kind of don't know. Uh, another big problem is fryers. Um, if you're frying something that's gluten-free, it has to be in a dedicated fryer. It cannot be in a fryer that shares um, w- that's shared with wheat. So if it fries chicken fingers or whatever it may be, those little weedy particles stay behind, and they can attach to the gluten-free ingredients that go in there. So a lot of times restaurants, you know, if, if I see – Anything like the fries or like a, a fried anything labeled gluten-free, I'm always going to question it because most times, most kitchens do not have the space to have a dedicated fryer. Um, and, I mean, that's, that's a problem um, because some restaurants just say, oh, well, it's gluten-free ingredients. You know, well, but the safe handling has to come into play too because, you know, a steak is gluten-free and a burger is gluten-free without a bun. But if you cook the burger on the grill – where you just set down the bun, then you've just cross-contaminated it, so I can't eat it now. Or if you use the spatula that you, to flip the buns to flip my burger, well, now I can't eat it. So it's that little extra step of handling safe, of, doing, of having safe handling procedures that makes sure that the item goes from start to finish and it's still free of cross-contact. So it's, yeah, well, I think it has to do with just education because right. – I mean, I'll admit that I, you know, I didn't know all of that that you just explained. I mean, I, I would just think, okay, well, if it says it's gluten free and it's, you know, I didn't know about the, all of this cross contamination and, right. and all of that. So I think it has to do a lot with just education with these people just not being aware of how tricky it is to keep things separate and how important that is. Right. So, um, so that's it good is, that you're 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 helping to educate people on, on that process. And so do you do you get invited to a lot of media dinners or do they like to have you in separately because they have to prepare a special menu for you? Well, you know, some PR firms, I will admit, do not invite me in um, to events because they're just concerned they won't be able to feed me. And mm-hmm. I completely understand that. But if I'm going to a media event where there's going to be 40 or 50 people, I'm going to handle it on my own. So I'd rather they invite me in. And then I'll just tell them, hey, make sure to tell the chef I'm gluten-free. But then when I get there, I'll go talk to the chef, and I'll handle it myself. I don't expect uh, someone from a PR firm to go make sure that my food is gluten-free. I'd rather do that myself anyway, just to make sure that 
the chef and I are on the same page um, and, and all that's going on. Sometimes they will make a separate plate for me. Um, usually they just modify what's coming out. So I'm getting basically what everybody else is except I have a modified plate. Um, so, I mean, I, I'd rather get invited in than, than not because it just, you know, it, it can be my call. Do, I do get to go to some great media events and, and try some lovely food, and it, it's, it's great to feel included in, the, in those kinds of things because, you know, the restaurants want their gluten-free food highlighted just as much as they want the rest of the menu highlighted. Yeah, well, I mean, the gluten-free eating is becoming bigger and bigger. And um, so talk to us about how do you feel about these people that they don't have celiac disease, but they're eating it just because it's maybe they feel better or they think they feel better or it's fashionable to eat gluten-free. What do you think about that? Well, it's just confusing to me. (laughs) It's confusing to me why anyone would choose to eat gluten-free if there is no medical benefit. I mean, because that's the whole idea behind it, is that you're eating this way to stay healthy and strong and strengthen your immune system and fight off illness. Um, I think they're, in a way, they're, they're damaging our ability to get a safe meal because I never thought I would be asked when I walked into a restaurant if I was eating gluten-free by choice or for a medical reason. Mm -hmm. It just kind of shocked me the first time somebody asked me that. Um, Or how gluten-free does your food need to be? (laughs) And I just kind of (laughs) said, what? You know, I'm like, I want it to be completely 100% gluten-free. And and that's because people who eat gluten-free by choice don't worry about cross-contact because it's not an issue for them. They're not going to have any kind of a reaction. So, I mean, I think it's brought a level of awareness to restaurants, but I think at the same time, some of them just don't take it seriously. So, you know, if I find myself in that kind of a situation, you know, I'm usually like when I'm talking to a server and he's looking at me funny, I'm like, can you just bring the chef out? Can I talk to yeah. the chef? Um, because, you know, I just, I don't want to get sick um, and they don't want to make me sick. So, you know, I mean, just as long as we've got good communication going on, uh, I'm sure it'll be fine. It's, I never thought it would be a trend. It, it just, I, I laughed out loud when somebody called it a food trend. You know, it's the new um, What's the South Beach diet? And I'm like, yeah, it isn't. But okay, you know, if people want to do that. Um, it, it's been great for the natural products industry because there's mm-hmm. a bunch of great new products that have come out because of it. Um, companies like General Mills is coming out with gluten-free products and Betty Crocker has them now. So it, it's done, it's, it's, there's a level of awareness with brands that wasn't there before. But, yeah, with restaurants, you really have to be careful because a a lot of things will be labeled on a menu uh, with a GF next to it or a G or however they they decide to do it. But Mm -hmm. it might not be gluten-free. So you you have to be able to ask that question. And for the people who are newly diagnosed, it's very confusing. Now that there is so much, at the same time, you kind of have to be careful about it and make sure that you're asking the right questions and Make sure you tell your server, I am a celiac. You know, I'm not eating gluten-free by choice. And they definitely handle your order like an allergy. I I, I do wish that people who are eating gluten-free for no particular reason would kind of stop if they're not getting a medical benefit from it. I mean, if they're – I mean, when I went gluten-free, I gained 15 pounds. I was horribly skinny when I got diagnosed, and I put on weight, which is what's – which is what can happen. You can be really thin and have celiac disease. You can be very overweight and have celiac disease. You can be in the middle. I mean, you people who are overweight tend to lose weight. People who are really skinny tend to gain it. So it's not a, it's not a diet loss plan. It's a I would like to be able to be healthy and function as a human being plan. And plus the fact that gluten-free foods are a, a lot more expensive than buying a regular loaf of wheat bread. Of so, course, yeah. I mean, I think the people who are eating gluten-free for, for fad diet reasons will eventually fade away, and those of us who will be doing it for life will always be here and always be supportive of brands and restaurants who are going that extra mile for us. Um, do you know what the percentage of the population it has celiac disease? Just celiac disease, um, it's supposed to be every one in 133 people. Some places will tell you it's one in every 100 people, so it's... It's not a huge percentage. Um, The people who have non-celiac gluten sensitivity are much higher. Um, They're the people who don't have celiac disease but follow a gluten-free diet because for medical reasons, such as people who have rheumatoid arthritis, 
some people who have MS follow it. Some children who um, have autism follow a gluten-free and a casein-free diet. So um, roughly, I think it's about 7 to 8% of the population if you add up the celiacs and the the gluten sensitive. So it's not a it's not a huge percentage, um, but it is to me, you know. So, oh yeah, of course. Uh, and more and more people are getting diagnosed. Um, so I mean, the 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 fad diet aspect has helped that. It has raised awareness, and people who are have been experiencing headaches or you know other unpleasant symptoms will go in now and see a gastroenterologist and ask to get a blood test and see if they have celiac disease. And you know, it's it's life changing. You know, you go from, at least for me, you go from um, having enough energy to go to and from work, and that's kind of it, um, to being able to function and, and enjoy life and not fear what you're eating because you don't know what's going to happen the next time you eat, um, a fear of leaving the house because you don't want to have some kind of an embarrassing food reaction when you're out uh, with a group of people. So it's, it's, it's life-changing. Um, it's hard to diagnose, so when you do get diagnosed, it's it's one of those, oh, thank goodness, moments. You know, I'm not a crazy person, and I'm not dying, and I'm not a hypochondriac, and, you know, there is something wrong with me, and, oh, this is what it is, and now I can get myself well. So mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and now we're lucky in this day and age that there's so many restaurants that are catering to uh, to the gluten-free diet, so right. great. And with the help of people like you, of course. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, so tell us if, if a restaurant did want to contact you, how can, how can they reach you, Jennifer? Um, my email address, they can go to my website at gfgotoguide.com, and they can email me at jennifer at gfgotoguide.com. I'm also on Twitter, so you can find me there at, it's just gf, g, sorry, I have a little cold. GF go to guide. Okay, and if uh, other people are traveling to Atlanta and they have celiac disease, they can tweet to you and ask you for restaurant recommendations as well, right? Yes, absolutely. And, and up on my website, I have um, two lists: a list of um, restaurants uh, and a list of bakeries. So it's a good starting point for them to plan where they want to go, what they want to try, um, and uh, really get an idea of what Atlanta is all about when it comes to our food scene. Uh, I really had no idea how lucky we are. <laughs> and I travel to other areas, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> there really well, isn't I miss all this Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really yeah. do. I mean, I miss Atlanta for not just for dining but for shopping. We're really lucky with the selection of grocery stores and supermarkets that we have and health food stores. Um, but, yeah, just in general, there's a lot – it just seems like there's a lot more locally owned restaurants here in Atlanta than there are in other areas. And Well, I just want to say thank you, Jennifer, for taking the time out of your schedule to chat with us today. I think that everyone who listens to this podcast is – really going to learn a lot about eating gluten-free and what is involved with celiac disease. So I really appreciate you educating us on that and and sharing your journey with us. And I think that it also helps people or other bloggers who might want to write about a specific niche and get into consulting. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. It's a a fun job, (laughs) and I'm glad I could... Uh, educate people on on what they can do when they put their mind to it. Well, thank you. All right. Well, I look forward to seeing you at an event soon. All right. Thanks. Okay. Take care.